last week I published a conversation with Cameron Cloutier and Josh Eisenstadt, uh, partly on YouTube and uh, in large part on Patreon, where we discussed Cameron's fan film, upcoming fan film, uh, Black Rose. And we also included Josh in the conversation talking about general Twin Peaks topics. Now, uh, quite a bit of material about, uh, let's see, I think about um, 12 or 13 minutes was cut out where Josh discussed his film. And also we discussed some other Twin Peaks stuff that was related to his film, which was about Teresa Banks. And that project was in flux when I released that conversation. So I just excluded all that. Well, now uh, they've confirmed that they are going to go forward with their joint fundraising for these two fan films. They're going to share productions. And it is going to be Teresa with a T about Teresa Banks. So we touched on that a little bit in that other conversation where we talked about Josh's friendship with Pamela Gidley, the actress who played uh, Teresa Banks and passed away several years ago. But in this uh, uh, excerpt or this part, I guess, that I'm including here now on YouTube, I'm going to include the rest of what we discussed. So this is all going to be here in this video. Um, you can listen to it in conjunction with the conversation I put up, the half hour one on YouTube and the two hour one on Patreon. Um, this is kind of the third missing piece, if you will, of that conversation. So sorry it got released in a little bit of a convoluted manner, but there were some questions about whether that project was going forward or not. So I held off for the time being. I hope you enjoy listening to this. And of course, if you want to hear uh, the conversation in its entirety, you can become a patron for $5 a month. Uh, there's a whole archive of additional parts of conversations going back 20 something episodes of that. And of course, monthly rewards as well uh, with, you know, other uh, films covered and things like that. So uh, you can check it all out there. We didn't want to do it separately, obviously, because the films are connected in some ways. And one donation goes to both films. I don't think anybody's ever done that yet in, in the fan community. If you know me and you know Josh, you know that we're not going to half-ass this. Uh, you know, you've seen Queen of Hearts and uh, you know what Josh can do. And you know how our brains work in terms of striving to make it the best we can. What we have in store is going to be really exciting and definitely something that you've never seen before. As far as Josh goes, we're going to talk about his film as well here, Teresa with a T. So tell the listeners a little bit about what your film is. Give them a quick pitch of, of what you're doing uh, or what you're hoping to do. And um, I guess what brought you to this point, making it now after so many years of being a Twin Peaks fan? I've always been fascinated by the Teresa Banks character. And I've always thought there is so much that we don't know. And there's so much untapped potential with that character. And that's why when The Missing Pieces came out, I was thrilled to be able to see more of this Teresa Banks stuff. So to me, there was just a lot there with that character that we don't know. And part of what interested me is a lot of the unknown mysteries around Teresa. How did she get the ring, being one of the big ones? How does she tie into the larger picture? What are some of her personal motivations? To me, one thing that I really want to do is I want to humanize the Teresa Banks character even more. I really want to humanize this character. I want to do for her what Fire Walk With Me did for Laura Palmer in a way. Yeah. I see the Teresa Banks character as some a character that is, I, she's, I don't think she's an evil person. I don't think she's even really a bad person. I think she's an unfortunate person. I, I see Teresa Banks as this, as this girl that was basically lost her family. One thing that I want to do in the film is contrast her with Ronette Pulaski, who we know is her friend. Mm -hmm. Had she had a different upbringing, had she had a parents, had she had a family, she might have actually been a successful businesswoman or something like that. But my vision of Teresa Banks is this girl that is forced to do what she has to do to survive, but wants out. And when she sees who Leland is and she blackmails him, mm -hmm. that is her ticket out. Now, she's in the middle of another big mystery that involves the ring and the forces behind that. And I also am going very, very heavily into the two Chalfonts. The mm -hmm. fact that we learned in Fire Walk with me about that that trailer, the old woman of the Grand Center in it, but there was a family named Chal, there was somebody named Chalfont who rented that space before, which is very similar to what we see with the Tremonts in season two, where we have the middle aged Mrs. Tremont who appears there later when Donna goes back with Cooper in episode 16. Mm -hmm. So I want to explore who the original Chalfonts were. And mm -hmm. that plays a big role. And also, how did why did Teresa Banks was murdered in the Chalfon trailer? How did she end up in that trailer? Why did yeah. she move to Deer Meadow a month before? Why did she live in the same trailer park with Deputy Cliff? Because that's mentioned multiple times in Fire Walk with Me, 
and he now, will put it in there for a reason. Joel, one thing that like people never bring up with Fire Walk with me, and and it wasn't even something that da- it dawned on me until I was talking with Josh, is that the FBI have no clue where Teresa was killed. Otherwise, the whole mobile park would be a crime scene. Correct. It's an yeah. unknown crime scene. Yeah, they don't know what point. They'll find the body, but not, uh, but it's floating in a river. Right. Exactly. And because the, the child font trailer is gone, so they have no crime scene. So I guess to bring it back around to your film and uh, kind of what, you know, inspired this, like at what point would you say in, I know you said you've always been fascinated by her story and all this. When do you, when did it sort of start to coalesce for you that this might be something that you would want to make a fan film? Because I know you've made uh, plenty of films before, but have you made, have you dabbled in fan films or will this Never. be the first? Okay. Interesting. Yeah. First time. Um, it was talking to Cameron, I think, about a year ago. You saw Queen of Hearts, and you were like, oh, I can do this. It was before you were going to do a sequel, and I was talking to you. You kept saying, like, oh, I like these ideas. You should explore them. And then I said, well, what would you do if you had something? And you said, I want to do Teresa Banks. And that's how the seeds started percolating. Oh, well, you know, there's similar locations we can use. There are similar characters we can use. We can actually do this where they could cr- cross in and out of each other's projects. And I'll also say this, too, about the Teresa Banks film. There's some things in there that are tie-ins that will be completely unexpected. But I believe they make perfect sense and will actually explain some things even from season three. As surprising as that sounds, Hmm. and I probably should keep that as cryptic as it sounds, but (laughs) there are some little Easter eggs that are going to be there, and it won't be overdone, but they'll be there. Well, it's like a lot of people, Josh, when they saw Queen of Hearts, they had no idea that I was going to throw in season three or the final dossier into it, you know? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Or my life, my tapes. <laughs> or, or, well, that too. But I mean, just the idea of tulping Annie and so we could get her out of the hospital, but still keep her in the final dossier continuity. The idea of like, you know, her showing up at the end with, you know, Richard and Carrie and all that. Like it just, people didn't expect all that. <laughs> but it was like, well, how else are you going to tell the story? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it made perfect sense. And so there's, yeah, like that. There's a lot of little things that I that I didn't set out to do, but when I started kind of mapping out the storyline, it just made mm-hmm. sense. And like I said, a lot of things have to do with that two sets of chow fonts. I think that's a crucial element in the Teresa Banks story that remains untold. Mm-hmm. The fact that the chow fonts were there in the trailer park. Why were they there? Yeah. Why did they? Ca- who were the original chow fonts that were there? Why yeah. did they take over for them? And that will be definitely covered. And also to me, to bring it back around to Pamela, I see this also as a tribute to her and her memory Mm -hmm. because Pamela was just a, just a wonderful person, just a wonderful, warm, vibrant, alive. I mean, you think of Pamela, anybody that knew her would say this, just that's why it was just such a shock what happened with her because she was just always so alive. And you believe that if she was still alive, she probably would make the film with you. She probably would. Uh, yeah, she. Pro- I, I, I believe so. The only question would be, I mean, we'd have to pull like an Irishman, wouldn't we? No, if Cheryl Lee can come back and, and do uh, Laura <laughs> Palmer for season three. Uh, and they know, didn't do the Irishman technology on that. That's true. They just did. A they just shot in black and white. Stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, another thing that Josh's film would get into is, uh, you know, how did she get to Deer Meadow, right? Yes, correct. Mm-hmm. And why Deer Meadow? Why is she in Deer Meadow now? Just to give a little bit of a hint, if we think about this. We know that Deputy Cliff does business with, business with Jacques Renault. Yeah. We know Teresa Banks knows Jacques Renault. So I'm yeah. kind of putting my hand a little bit, but there's the thread right there. And I even think even the tentative title that we came up with, Teresa with a T, I mean, that's for hardcore Twin Peaks fans. That's, you know, for the yeah. international pilot people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If somebody gets that reference, they're really into it. <laughs> there's something else that intrigues me about this, and I'd be sort of interested to see how you played with this in the film. I had a whole theory of the ring before the third season mm-hmm. and i would say the third season makes it if not necessarily untenable like something that they don't continue but i honestly kind of prefer it to what they did which is um it's probably a little too much to get into now actually i've talked about it other other places i'll link them in the show notes and stuff um and maybe we can get into another time but part of what it involves is this fact that when you see her in the chow font trailer um i remember on the dugpa board discussing this years ago with other people they pointed out that the ring is not on her finger actually That's when he correct. kills her. And so this whole idea of like the ring dooms you, it's like, to me, it seems like they show the ring very carefully and selectively in Firewalk with me. And it's whenever she has 
she's getting some kind of knowledge or advantage over Leland. So, which makes it even more significant that the time you don't see it is when he's racing in to kill her, basically. But I love that whole little corner of that and, universe. And the fact that Teresa <laughs> is all tied up. Why would Leland have to race in there and kill her if she's tied up? Correct. I get into all of that. She Interesting. Tied up her hands are I didn't tied know that. Feet. I only know that she was crouching. I never noticed that. Interesting. Yeah, if you look at the first shot, you'll see that there's rope around her hands and wow, rope around okay. her feet, which always intrigued me because we yeah. see Leland rush in, which means Leland didn't tie her up. And also, she never would have let Leland tie her up. She was in the Chalfont trailer and she was tied up. So the big question for me always was, how did that happen? And I get into my theory of exactly how that happened in the film. I'll show how that happened uh, down to every detail. I'll also show exactly why, and I know I think I've said this before on podcasts, so people that have heard me on podcasts have probably heard this, but I'll also go into exactly why Leland smashed the TV, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I have a very specific reason why I believe Leland smashed that TV. You've already said it on other podcasts. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll say it again. Uh, basically, I think the clue is when we see the TV, when Leland has the flashback and we see the mm -hmm. TV, you notice the sound we hear coming from the TV. It's the sound of the arm. Right. So my idea of it is that the man from another place, the arm, who we know, who I also believe is, you know, we know is directly connected to Mike, yeah. whose main goal is to stop Bob, is coming through that TV because they go through electricity. And that's why he hears the sound of the arm coming from the TV. And the second he hears that, he smashes the TV to stop, to stop him yeah. from coming through. Yeah. And the electrical flow as well of the spirit world. Yeah. That makes exactly. sense. So he shuts um, that down. That, that's the reason why. I'll tell you this too, Joel. My plan at the very end of the Teresa Banks film is the first credit at the very end. It's going to say for Pamela. Nice. Yeah. It's going to hold for a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's going to essentially be a dedication to her. And that's kind of also, I see it as that too. Well, let me ask you too. So you know, you said you're sharing sets, you're sharing actors. Now you, I think, how far apart do you and Josh live? Because I know he's in LA, right? And you're like sort of he's, central or he's about five. He's about five hours from me. Five hours. So are you shooting in LA for this one or in so, addition to Snoqualmie North Bend area? In Washington? Yeah. And, pr and probably my area, Monterey as well. And your area as well. Yeah. You know, you know why, right? I mean, well, one, I live here, but two, you got the what, vertigo what, connection. <laughs> well, there's that, but what else was shot in Monterey right on my beach here? Well, a lot of movies besides the lost boys and stuff, but like right on the beach, right out here, five minutes from me. Well, Five Minutes in One Direction is the Monterey Fairgrounds where Monterey Pop was filmed, where the Otis Redding recording. Oh, nice. Was yeah, of course. And then the other direction, Five Minutes the Other Way to the Beach, that's where Marlon Brando shot One Eye Jags. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, wow. All right. Yeah. And that's so, absolutely so, perfect for what so you're So that doing. was another, you know, and the fact that of all people, Donna knows, isn't that movie with Marlon Brando? Like, I don't know why she knows this movie. Yeah, that's right. She throws that line out because um, they're obsessed with the fifties. I mean, I know it's 1960, but close right. enough. But what I'm saying though, is like with Maddie, I had, or with Annie, I had the whole vertigo reference with the nunnery. And now because, because yeah. when I Jackson was filmed here, it just seemed like, you know, it was one of those Lynchian things where it was like, well, yeah. now I have to deal with one. So, so what you're telling me is you're getting Michael Sarah for this film and he's going to have a cameo as, um... Oh no. <laughs> I mean, if he wants to, if he's you know, <laughs> jet on through, we can have a Wally Brando monologue, I guess. Yeah. But, uh... This time he can do it as a cowboy. So my, a my, my feeling is right, right off the top. I feel like it's going to be Southern California area my area again and then obviously washington for yeah whatever it's gonna be quite something but it, but instead of like shooting on weekends like i did with queen of hearts which took me six months yeah um i think the plan this time is we're just gonna do like a six-week shoot just straight yeah. up you know well especially if you're combining sets and actors it's like if they're going to jump from one film to the other then yeah right well i don't know if we're gonna go back to back Right. I don't know. Oh, okay. If, Interesting. I don't know if Josh goes first or I go first. I think it's basically like because he actually, you know, works in Hollywood. Right. Yeah. I, I think what's going to happen is it seems like it. it's going to be my film going first. And then the sets that he would need for his film, he would just come in and shoot those scenes. Um, and then he'd probably pick up his shoot after i was done hmm. but he would like get his have his actors ready so he, 
he wouldn't have to shoot his film right after mine, but he could just shoot his scenes that he would need. Yeah. Yeah. Especially you're talking up in Washington as well, or. Oh, well, I mean, he's dealing yeah. with Teresa Banks, right? Up in Deer Meadow <laughs> and all that. Right? He's yeah. got to, um, even though that was filmed in, you know, North Bend Snoqualmie area too. It's just like, you know, it's, yeah. it's still, you need that kind of uh, atmosphere up there. And that's it for what was left out again for two hours more of a discussion. You can check out the uh, Patreon part two of the conversation and also the half hour I put up on YouTube before this, uh, mostly talking about Cameron's film.